It's a favorite tactic of anyone who wants to undermine science. Compile a list of quotes, usually from scientists, and usually taken out of context. Moncton does this, of course, but he also goes a step further. If he doesn't think the quote is convincing enough, he'll simply change it. One of the climate gate conspirators here, talking privately, says there has been no global warming for a decade. We cannot explain why. It is a travesty that we can't. The first thing to be suspicious of, if someone throws a quote at you, is the lack of a source. And very few Moncton quotes are properly sourced, which of course makes it harder to see whether they're real or imaginary. ClimateGate, for example, isn't a source. A date and an email reference would be a source. But this one is fairly easy to track down, because the East Anglia University emails are all listed on the net, and there's a search engine to locate particular emails. And this is the famous one from Trenberth that Moncton's referring to. The exact quote is, The fact is that we can't account for the lack of warming at the moment, and it's a travesty that we can't. Now, if this means the same thing, then why change it? Trenberth, of course, was referring to the energy budget. Moncton thinks he should have been saying something more akin to a key Moncton argument about the lack of global warming for a decade, so presto, Moncton changes the quote to make it comply. Of course, it now means something very different. If you want to argue that it doesn't change the meaning at all, and it still means exactly the same thing, then why change it? Why not tell us what Trenberth actually wrote and let us make up our own minds about the meaning? This is a question I want you to bear in mind as we go through a list of other fabricated quotes. If this was an isolated case, it could be regarded as a sloppy error, but it's part of a pattern of carefully changed and rearranged quotes that pepper Moncton's presentations. Here's another one. And he said, The Armageddon scenario that he depicts is not based on any scientific view. This is supposed to be a quote from Justice Burton, the judge who ruled on the use of Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, in British schools. I was sceptical of this as soon as I heard it, because I was aware of the court case, and this quote just didn't seem to fit the judge's final ruling. So I checked a transcript of the summing up. No surprise, Moncton had changed it. This is what the judge actually said. It is common ground that if indeed Greenland melted, it would release this amount of water but only after and over millennia, so that the Armageddon scenario he predicts, insofar as it suggests that sea level rises of 7 metres might occur in the immediate future, is not in line with the scientific consensus. It's interesting to see what Moncton doesn't like in a quote. Moncton always questions whether there's a consensus on climate change, so he changes not in line with the scientific consensus to not based on any scientific view. Now, in his speech in this slide, Moncton does preface this misquote by pointing out the judge was referring to Gore's claim of a 20-foot sea level rise. But that's not always the case. According to an interview with Climate Depot in 2009, Moncton said the judge was referring to Gore's entire movie, and this has inevitably been copied and pasted all over the internet. Now, I'm no fan of Al Gore's film. I've criticised it myself in an earlier video, and I agree with Moncton that it shouldn't be shown in schools. But I didn't need to misrepresent what the judge said in order to rebut Gore's film. I just needed to state the facts. An appalling admission which was compounded by an admission on the part of the lead author of the subchapter in question that he knew that figure was wrong but had left it in anyway because he knew that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change wanted to influence governments and politicians. So, in other words, once again, an admission they were going to lie. Moncton is referring to Dr. Murari Lal, who wrote the report on Himalayan glaciers for the IPCC. The now famous catalogue of errors began when new scientist interviewed Syed Hasnain, lead author of a four-year study by the International Commission on Snow and Ice. According to New Scientist, Hasnain's four-year study indicates that all the glaciers in the central and eastern Himalayas could disappear by 2035 at their present rate of decline. New Scientist is now calling it a speculative comment. But it wasn't reported as a speculative comment, it was reported as the conclusion of a four-year study. The Worldwide Fund for Nature picked it up, and Lal, incredible as it may sound, got his information from the WWF. In the Mail on Sunday story, David Rose quoted Lal as saying, We knew the WWF report with the 2035 date was grey literature, 
which means material not published in a peer-reviewed journal. But it was never picked up by any of the authors in our working group, nor by any of the more than 500 external reviewers by the governments to which it was sent, or by the final IPCC review editors. Moncton turned Lau's statement that he knew the 2035 figure wasn't peer-reviewed into an admission by Lau that he knew the figure was wrong. But not even the mail suggested any such thing. Rose had to set the record straight later by saying he didn't accuse Lal of knowingly publishing false information. This is Moncton's pure invention. Now, the first chairman of this intergovernmental panel on climate change was Sir John Horton. And he said, unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. There, from the chairman of the organization which is supposed to be giving us unprejudiced science on climate change is a statement that unless we announce disasters, no one will listen, a statement that we are going to reserve the right to ourselves to exaggerate the science so that we can make people listen to us. Sir John Houghton, whom you see there, the first chairman of the science panel of the IPCC, said unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. Moncton's most famous quote has an even more interesting history. He cites a book that Houghton wrote on the subject without saying what it was. But the thing about citing a source is that you actually have to have read the source yourself. For example, I don't have a copy of Houghton's book, so I can't claim the quote isn't in there. But I can cite a story in Britain's independent newspaper saying that the Houghton quote was made up. It traced the quote back to a November 2006 column by Piers Ackerman, writing in Australia's Daily Telegraph, and here it is. Ackerman does give the title of the book, Global Warming, The Complete Briefing, published in 1994. But it's obvious he never read it, and it's obvious Moncton never read it either, because the Independent checked the book and couldn't find the quote anywhere. On February 18th, Ackerman decided that he hadn't got the quote from Houghton's book at all. He'd got it from a Sunday Telegraph article dated September the 10th, 1995. And here it is. And what was the quote? Uh, unless we announce disasters, no one will listen? Uh, no. What Houghton actually said was, if we want a good environmental policy in the future, we'll have to have a disaster. And he explained exactly what he meant by that. It's like safety on public transport. The only way humans will act is if there's been an accident. Ackerman explained, How that remark came to be slightly paraphrased in the quotation sent to me, we shall probably never know. That sort of thing occurs in the blogosphere. Well, duh, yes, of course it does. That's why all these urban myths you read on the internet can't be trusted. But come on, slightly changed? According to Moncton, the fake Houghton quote means we're going to just make it up so as to scare you until you listen. So if this means the same thing as this, and this means the same thing as this, then quotes aren't really quotes at all. They're just interpretations of what you think someone should have said and can be changed over and over again. After the independent story was published, those who had been using the fabricated quote began backtracking, but of course not apologising or accepting responsibility for their sloppy research. My favourite excuse came from Christopher Booker, another UK Telegraph contributor, who said that he was misled by the internet into assuming the quote was genuine. Yes, damn that internet for confusing me and not letting me check a source properly. But at least Booker agreed to take the fake quote out of his book in the next edition. Moncton simply kept on using it and didn't change a word. He said, unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. Or words to that effect. It, it came in a Telegraph, Sunday Telegraph article about uh, a dozen years ago. He now tries to deny that he said anything like this, but in fact he did. No, he didn't. If you now know where this quote came from, and you now accept that it's inaccurate then you shouldn't keep on using it, however useful it may be in supporting your arguments. You should check the Telegraph story for yourself and tell people what Houghton actually said. In all his previous errors, Moncton at least had the excuse that he's not a scientist and he has no scientific training. So if he misunderstood and misrepresented the papers he was supposedly reading, it comes as no surprise. But here he should know better. Moncton has a diploma in journalism, so he would have learned that one of the first rules of good journalism is you can't make up quotes, or interpret what someone says, or paraphrase what they say, and put quotation marks around it, and tell people they said it. 
Surely that must be obvious even to people with no training in journalism. Apparently not. The most worrying thing about these fabricated quotes is what I discovered in the comments that followed Ackerman's article. Some posters didn't seem to mind at all that they were being fed a fabrication. Pierre's quote is correct. Different words, but the same meaning. Then why change the original? Seems to be an accurate paraphrase to me. But an accurate paraphrase is not the same as a quote. And an inaccurate paraphrase purporting to be a quote is a fabrication. If the words are different but have the same meaning, then why not stick with the words that were actually spoken? The only reason to change the quote, even with a verb tense or a preposition change, is that it does change the meaning. That's why people do it. It's not only downright dishonest and a clear case of fabrication, it's also patronizing. Audiences shouldn't need to have quotes filtered through to them by a process of interpretation and rewording by someone else. You can give your own opinion on a quote, that's fine, or tell people what you think it means, but you can't change it or make it up. We're all capable of hearing a quote uncensored and making up our own minds about what we think it means. This is something Moncton preaches at nearly every presentation. I'm going to take the approach of Fox News. We report, you decide. I will give you a covenant that everything I say to you is independently verifiable. There has been no global warming for a decade. I'm just going to give it to you straight for the truth alone is worthy of our entire devotion. And he said, the Armageddon scenario that he depicts is not based on any scientific view. What I am striving for here is to reach the truth. The objective of science, of economics, and of politics is nothing less than the truth. An admission on the part of the lead author of the subchapter in question that he knew that figure was wrong. And before we subjugate the truth to mere expediency, convenience or profit, it is first desirable to discern the truth. Unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. If you get the science wrong and the policy wrong because you didn't start with the truth, then people end up dead. You can check, should you wish to do so, that I am not misleading you or pushing you in any political or scientific or economic or moral direction.